It's 8.02, only two minutes late. Only two minutes late. Someone needs to help me with navigating social media passwords. It's always so many passwords. This is the, the, this is, I can't speak either. This is a podcast. This is the broadcast of the This Week in Science podcast. We will be here for the next hour and a half or so talking about science and If you want to get the podcast, make sure to download it wherever the podcasts are found. The whole thing is recorded here, right now, live. And then I hack it up and chop it up into little bits. And that that repurposed recording is what goes out as the podcast. So those of you who are here for this conversation, you get the whole thing. Blair, are we ready to go? We're ready. We are ready. Starting in, let me get my, all my pieces of my documents in place. There we <laughs> go, so I can actually say the words, say the words. And, oh my goodness, these windows are not placed appropriately. Ready to start the show in three, two, this is twist this week in science episode number 826 recorded on wednesday may 26th 2021 it's the little things that make the difference in science hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we are going to fill your heads with doom dear and just the gist but first Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Though you may be watching this from the comfort of your temperature controlled home on your cutting edge high tech device while consuming your chemically derivedly delicious sustenance, you are still simply an organism in an ecosystem with a role to play. Though you wear mass produced coverings, mask your scent with artificial aromas, augment your appearance with pigments and fill your days with mathematically created code, you are simply a hairless ape in a colony of the same. No matter how much we separate ourselves from the natural world, we will forever be a part of it. And no matter how much we try to make sense of it, it is simply the system in which we will forever participate. So if you want to hear these hairless apes chat about things which often cannot be explained, since it is far bigger than our very own existence, we are here to provide you some food for your overgrown frontal lobe. Tonight on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening Good science to you, Kiki. And a good science to you too, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about science. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's what we do. We come here weekly to discuss science news stories that we found fanciful, fanciful, fantastic, fascinating, that piqued our curiosity. And we hope that this show does the same for you. Tonight, I brought stories about, what did I bring tonight? I've got a little bit of stem cell relaxation. I've got a gist. I've got the gist gist. about a gist. And we have an interview with Dr. Elizabeth Bick about scientific integrity and microbiomes. What'd you get? For the animal corner, Blair. Oh, I have climate change, bird poop, primate accents, and wolves. Great. Lots of animals. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. A little bit of climate in there. Yeah. Okay. It's all connected. <laughs> and a little poop because... It's always. Always a little poop in the Yes, as corner. we learned in our trivia, we talk about poop a lot on this show. So, <laughs> we do. you know. <laughs> We'll just put one more in the tally. Yeah. Okay, for those of you who are not yet subscribed to this program, 
You can find us by looking for This Week in Science on just about any podcast platform that's out there. Google, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, Spreaker, Radio, TuneIn, all of them. We're out there. We're also on YouTube, Facebook, and on Twitch. Our website is twist.org. Time for more science. More science? The science. Okay. I have some headline stories that I want to start the show with tonight. Just really quick run through, yeah. run down, because I wanted to hit a lot of notes. And I, I was just like, why don't I just knock them all out with a, mm-hmm. just quick headlines? All right. A meta-analysis of 338 studies of vaccine safety published in the journal Vaccine found that the vaccines we use, the MMR vaccine, diphtheria, pertussis, flu, all, all sorts of name it. They probably were looking at it. We use are generally safe for kids and adults. This meta-analysis determined that aside from what we already knew were previously existing adverse events, that there you know, are certain individuals who do have right, higher risk for certain events to happen, no additional risks were confirmed. Vaccines are safe. Just so you know. Mm-hmm. And on that note, the CDC has told doctors to be on the lookout for myocarditis in young people following vaccination for COVID-19 as a result of reports to the agency's vaccine unit. However, the incidence of these reports is not more than what would normally be expected in the general population. So it's still, this is something that has been noticed by doctors. It's been reported in the uh, adverse events report system, but it isn't something that appears to be actually connected. They haven't made any connection to the COVID-19 vaccine specifically yet. But if doctors know to be on the lookout, they might find something we didn't know before. As for the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines, the CDC is also reporting just 0.01% rate of breakthrough infections, even with increasing spread of new variants. This means that the vaccines are very effective at preventing infections of all kinds. So let's keep up the pace and save lives. Yes. Yeah, we can do that. But even if you do survive COVID and all the other diseases that are out there, um, how long can you really be expected to live anyway? Blair, what do you, what would you guess your life expectancy? Oh, 200, 250. Yeah, that's your guess. (laughs) Little Miss wants to live forever. Um, Well, a new estimate of the potential absolute limit for human beings was based on blood cell counts and organismal resilience. It finds that the longest you can expect on this good earth is about 120 to 150 years. That's the limit. I'll take it. Yeah. That's what we. That, that's what they say. Okay. They think we're going to get. But I, 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 I imagine there will be some battles with the uh, anti-aging folk. Um, and finally, that brings me to what you really have to live for, right? If you want to live 120 and 150 years, you've got climate change on the horizon, oh, all sorts of issues related to that. But maybe, just maybe, maybe legal attempts will help the political and scientific efforts to draw down our massive carbon emissions. Uh, Dutch court ruled this week that the Shell Oil Company has until the end of the decade to get in line with the Paris Accord and cut its carbon emissions by 45%. I'm interested in seeing where this is going to go. How about you, Blair? Yeah, that's awesome. It's more of that, please. It's, we can't be trusted anymore to do things because it's the right thing to do. There have yeah. to be smackdowns if we're going to prevent catastrophe. Right. I mean, that there has to be more regulation. And if the political will isn't pushing hard enough, fast enough, maybe uh, legal efforts mm-hmm. will do that. Um, and this, uh, the Dutch courts actually back in 2019 had another uh, ruling that was based on a new standard, which uh, is basically comes down to don't do anything that is going to leave the planet worse off for future generations. And it's it's just a fantastic way to think, right? Yeah. But anyway, you had a story about climate yeah um so it turns out maybe none of that will matter because we'll all be infertile 
No. Um, what? Yeah. So it's it's very important to make sure that that the current generation of living things survive. But if they can't have babies, it's it's a huge problem anyway, right? So this is a study looking um, at the impacts of climate change on fertility versus the impacts of climate change on um, fatality, basically. Mm -hmm. So if temperatures aren't hot enough to kill you, will it make you infertile? And so this is specifically looking at uh, historical research, but now also this is research from the UK, Sweden, and Australia at fruit flies. So as with many things, we start with fruit flies. They have mm -hmm. short uh, lifespans, short generations. You get to see a lot of things in a short amount of time. Well, they looked at 43 species of these flies to test whether male fertility was a predictor of global fly distributions rather than the flies at which they, uh, the temperatures at which the fly dies. So that's their survival limit. And it did in fact follow that. So uh, where you see flies on the planet has more to do with where they are able to still have babies rather than where they're able to survive. And so um, they, from this data, they estimated both the temperature that is lethal to 80% of individuals and the temperature at which 80% of surviving males become infertile. So these two different buckets, right? And they found 11 of the 43 species experienced an 80% loss in fertility at cooler than lethal temperatures. And rather than it recovering over time, it actually, for infertility got worse over time after exposure. So infertility was uh, more pronounced. There was more impact of infertility based on high temperature exposure seven days after the exposure. And using that delayed measure, it looks like 44% of species showed fertility loss at cooler than lethal temperatures. So all of that to say, um, it, it you won't looks die like, immediately, but it'll yeah. be the slow decline of, yeah, of the population. Of, of yeah. the population. So yeah. I feel like there's two ways to look at this. One way is it's really bad for all living things, or um, that maybe this is in the end the earth trying to prevent us from overpopulating <laughs> i don't it could be an interesting uh overcorrection in a, in an accidental overcorrection you know the earth it would is be not definite, fully definitely definitely accidental cognizant. but um it is interesting to think about how um just socially birth rates are lower than in previous generations, right. but it would be interesting. Again, this was fruit flies. There have been previous studies looking at mammal species and infertility with ra rise, raised temperatures, things like cows, mm -hmm. pigs, fish, and birds. So there is a historical significance to this looking at fertility research, but this could be a thing. It's It, it could be, and it could just be one additional factor in... Mm -hmm not just mm -hmm. human populations. I mean, if human populations can maintain with air conditioning and moving right. around, yeah. but but our, our food crops and the species mm -hmm. that we rely on, uh, though they can't yeah. then, if ecosystems stop failing as climate change increases, yeah. then that's an issue. So 100%, yeah. It's all a system. But it's yeah, this does hark, harken back to the New York Times article from, I think, earlier this week. Everybody's going, uh, getting upset because... Uh, there was a New York Times article uh, pretty much about the decline of populations that uh, because of declining fertility rates, populations are de going to decline and that's going to affect the economy. And mm -hmm. da -da, yeah. people, had, people have put that together before, but I don't think anyone had written about it in such a, um, a prominent uh, newspaper previously. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's just the the big kind of flashing red lights that I wanted to bring up about this is when we talk about uh, climate change's impacts on population dynamics, fertility is an important piece. Huge. Yeah. Huge piece. Uh, well, speaking of fertility, what about s stem cells? Stem cells mm -hmm. are those wonderfully reproducible cells that can become, especially if they, they are the kind of stem cells that become any kind of cell in the body, the pluripotent kind, then uh, they have much that they can do for us. However, governments have taken uh, oversight and passed laws about when we can do research, what money can go toward research funding. And uh, over a governing body, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, 
provides guidelines to the research community internationally on kind of what research you should be doing that you could be doing um, and really helps people follow along the moral, ethical lines, which are not necessarily the same for every country, for every society around the world. And so they, this last week, or this week actually, they dropped their new guidelines. And this is after a lot of conversation with with many scientists, ethicists, people around the world putting these guidelines together. They have a new three-tiered system for research into areas of concern. And the lowest tier, tier one, is the lowest level of concern. And into that tier is where they've put organoids, Brain organoids. We've talked about them on the for, on, on the show brains. before. Yeah, little mini brains, right? These little balls of nervous tissue that allow researchers to understand how brains work. But there have been questions raised about the uh, potential development of consciousness by these organoids. Well, the researchers have all agreed that organoids are still at an early enough state of research that there's no chance any organoid is going to reach consciousness within about the next five years. So they've put it at the lowest tier of concern. Next level is level two, and that is where they have put the transfer of human-animal chimeric embryos to a non-human uterus. So kind of like a middle level of concern. Okay, so it's a human and a mouse being put into, or a human and a rat being cells being put together in an embryo and having that embryo put into a rat uterus, for instance. There are uh, there are also human pig chimeras that are uh, being developed and others. The highest level of concern is anything involving the use of stem cell derived gametes for human reproduction, the transfer of chimeric or model human embryos to human or ape uteruses, Mm -hmm. and the editing of germline genomes. And those are prohibited at the highest level of concern. So for now, the stem cell community is policing themselves and saying, let's not do this. We're not going to make human ape babies. That's not something we're going to do. We're not making human animal chimeric organisms that we will then um, that we will then bring to term that is not going to happen. It's everyone's agreed that is not something that the scientific community, stem cell scientific community wants to do. Now, the final thing that they did though is they did drop their 14 day limit for human stem cell development. 14 days is just about when gastrulation starts getting started and it's a really interesting phase of cellular and organismal development. Dropping the 14-day limit doesn't mean much for some countries, like the UK actually has a law that says scientists cannot do research with human embryonic stem cells past day 14. That's it. The the United States does not. So the fact that we don't have that kind of a law now that this is kind of opened up, it, it, it does beg the question of what kind of research will this allow now? Or will the United States uh, politicians, will they will they create a law because they don't agree with the allowance Hmm. of further research? But it's open questions as to where this stuff will go. Cells in a dish is not the same as um, Mm -mm. cells in a uterus Mm -mm. uh, for, for sure. So it's an interesting, interesting state we are in. And it's wonderful that people are talking about the ethical aspects of where they want the research to go and how they want to manage it. I want more evidence and logic-based rules for these things. So this is exactly the direction we need to move in. We, and I'm really happy that they dropped the 14 day limit. That's yeah. It'll allow better understanding of Mm -hmm. of early development and it it could really, really assist scientists. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go from stem cells to your, poop story oh yeah poop and how we're all killing birds oh no (laughs) no No, that's not actually true um so this is a study from manchester metropolitan university and university of edinburgh looking at garden feeders in scotland so this is the big asterisk on this paper is that it is specifically about birds and bird feeders in scotland 
Got it. So before we extrapolate this to the whole world, just keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> however, this is not the whole world. No, okay. but it is a yeah. system that you can study for future yeah. research, right? So anyway, um, they they wanted to see how garden feeders were um, impacting local populations of birds. And uh, if you if you just want to see how a migratory population or a population that does not normally hang out where people are can run amok when you feed them, look at the Canada goose situation in North America. It's just a mess. <laughs> they are not supposed to stay here year round. They're pushing other native birds out. There's all sorts of stuff, right? So uh, they collected data on bird feeding in Scotland, just asking people, but also how else? Poop. So they collected fecal samples. Um, they're always near bird feeders. And um, then they also looked outside of these bird feeders in local gardens and personal gardens. And uh, they specifically were looking for peanuts. Why? Because peanuts are often found in bird feeder feed that's yes. sold in Scotland, but is not a local plant. <laughs> so right. that um, so that's, yeah, so that's like, okay, this bird was definitely feeding at this bird feeder. Also, just as some background, 150,000 tons of bird feed purchased in the UK, and that the amount of feed that they purchase is actually more than triple what uh, all the birds would need to sustain themselves. <laughs> So it's 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 a little excessive. And um, they they did a whole transect of Scotland. They were able to check um, all these woodland areas and specific uh, gardens and backyards. And they found that 49% of samples um, had peanuts in them, but moths, which is the natural prey of these birds, were in about 34% of samples. So the the, uh, this is specifically looking for blue tit uh, poop. And they found that uh, it does look like the blue tits are getting the majority of their food from bird feeders. It also shows that as far as a mile away from a bird feeder, they found peanuts in poop. Uh, so they're, they're, com they're coming from all over to those bird feeders and then dispersing back out. And um, the, this is a problem because there are increased populations of blue tits and they are aggressive to other birds in the area like willow tits. And so they're, they've actually been known to evict willow tits from their nesting holes. Mm. So this is a case where um, this, this species is actually causing further problems for other species because it's too easy to live. So this is, this is part of the conversation <laughs> that we've had on the show Previously, when people have asked about feeding wildlife, this is why feeding wildlife can be really tough. And I'm not going to say all bird feeders are bad because also sometimes like having a place for uh, an, a bird to drink if they're a migratory bird can be really helpful if they're in an urban landscape that has chopped up what used to be wild, right? So I think that this is a, an opportunity for actually um, for, for biologists to set some parameters for what kind of feed, uh, when to put out feed, and how much to put out. And uh, maybe there are certain areas that bird feeding is not suggested because you're right next yeah. to a forest and those birds are taken care of. But this is just kind of an interesting first look at um, bird feeders and how we might actually be hurting more than we're helping, which can be kind of hard to hear sometimes. Yeah, especially if it's helping the invasive species or the more aggressive species that push yeah. others others out. Yeah, absolutely. But that, yeah, that's really interesting as I have bird feeders at my house because I love the birds. I like to feed the birds, but sometimes yeah. I do wonder. Yeah, it's a great it's question. A, it's a good question. And maybe in your area, you have some endangered species that benefit from bird feeders because you don't live in Scotland. So that's right. I did wake up to a uh, a northern flicker at my window the other mm. day, which was a nice sight. But yeah. anyway, um, moving from poop to the microbiome, I have Ooh. one story before we get into our interview. Scientists from over sixty countries have published a sweeping analysis, and that, 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 I'm using it as a pun because they swept surfaces. <laughs> Uh, for microbes, and they looked for uh, genes for antimicrobial resistance, and they wanted to see kind of what species are out there in urban areas. So this is 60 countries um, and multiple continents we're talking about. The urban areas they looked in, 
sampling city surfaces and the air for microbiome evidence. They found 31 species present in 97% of the samples. So out of some 4,700 species that they did identify, there were 31 that are everywhere in every urban area. Um, Every urban area also had a fingerprint, so to say. Uh, The researchers at Weill Cornell University who were in charge of the study, they say that based on a swab of your shoe, they could probably pinpoint where you live within about 90 percent accuracy, which isn't, you know, 100 percent. It's not as good as, say, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. Right. But 90 um, percent efficacy uh, to identify where you live based on the bacteria in your urban area. They're hoping that they'll be able to, yeah, be able to figure out a, more about where antimicrobial resistance exists, where it doesn't exist. Maybe also not have to find genes from various organisms in the rainforest. How about a bus stop? You never know what lives there. (laughs) Maybe your bus stop is like the rainforest. Wow. Who knows? Who knows? This is This Week in Science. Thank you for listening. And if you are enjoying the show, please tell a friend. I would like to take this moment to introduce our guest to the show. Dr. Elizabeth Bick is a, whoop, let me see if I can get my uh, my words in front of my face. Some have called Dr. Bick a vigilante, but she's a PhD trained microbiologist and has studied a variety of microbes at the Dutch National Institutes for Health, the San St. Antonius Hospital in New Vigain, I cannot pronounce that correctly, (laughs) and Stanford University. In 2019, she left her role as Director of Science at Start Medical in order to independently pursue scientific integrity. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bick. Thank you so much for having me on. And I really enjoyed the talks about microbiome and poop, two of my favorite subjects. <laughs> so I You're in the right in, place. I fit right in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd love to find out about your your background. It's just fascinating the trajectory that your career has taken. Can you can you kind of take us on a little tour and how did you how did you get interested in microbes in the first place? Oh, uh, well, I studied biology and I I basically had a fantastic microbiology teacher and I I really enjoyed the labs, going into the labs and smelling all these different bacteria that have strange smells. And most of my my, uh, peer students did not like that. And I I just love that smell of of the the, the agar being uh, uh, prepared and and just the bacteria have different smells. And I realized that. And and I also found it really fascinating that these microscopically small creatures could, you know, grow in such amounts that we could actually start to see them on a colony on a plate. And yeah, it was just fascinating. And it was right around the time when molecular biology started. So we could also learn about their genes, we could sequence them. And I was just hooked right away. And so I I, I studied microbiology, I did my PhD in microbiology and, and stayed in that field for a very long time. For microbes, do you do you prefer bacteria, the fungi, or viruses? I'm a bacteria girl. I, I okay. uh, that's <laughs> uh, I, I found like viruses are are a bit scary because they're they're not really alive, but they're also not dead, and they can make us sick. And it's it's just very scary when you think of it that something that is not really alive is is can, can have such a profound impact on humanity as we are currently experiencing. Uh, but I don't know. I, I just, I guess, I grew up professionally with bacteria, and that is uh, that has been my uh, my topic of study for a very long time. And then you moved into scientific integrity. Right. What is scientific integrity, and <laughs> how did you come to how did you come to find it? <laughs> uh, well, scientific integrity is basically that as a scientist, you should remain honest and and true you should report what you're finding and not leave out certain amounts of data you should not steal somebody else's ideas you should not make up data and so if you if you don't follow these rules then you're maybe doing science misconduct you're basically cheating and you're 
uh, you're 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 lying about your results. And so I think that's a bad thing. I think scientists should be honest. And luckily, most scientists are honest. But because a lot of people are in science are pushed to uh, to publish as many papers as we can, uh, some people will try to break the rules and get uh, more papers published by cheating, by by making up stories. And so that is the part I'm interested in. And I think science misconduct can can be uh, tremendously bad for science because other people might not be able to replicate those results. If people lie and cheat then and publish that in a paper, then it's really hard for other people to replicate those results. And so it leads to a lot of waste of time and money. Uh, and it could even lead to, to maybe uh, uh, people dying, for example, if you if you lie about the effect that a vaccine a vaccine can have, as we can see now, then maybe people don't want to be vaccinated. And a lot of the mistrust about science uh, and and vaccines is based on uh, papers that are turn out, uh, that turn out to be uh, based on misconduct. And so I'm very passionate about misconduct, and I feel there should be more people uh, trying to correct science. And when did you when did you first kind of get started? I, I was doing back background reading, and uh, you somebody plagiarized some of your work. Is that what yes. what started your adventure? <laughs> yes, I, I was I was uh, reading somewhere about plagiarism, and I just thought, just for fun, let's try to to put one sentence that I had written and put it into Google Scholar within between quotes. So I did that, and I had not expected to find anything else than my own paper. But I found oh something God. else as well. I'm like, what? Oh Somebody God. stole my sentence. I wrote that sentence. I, I thought really hard about that sentence. I put a lot of effort in it. And then somebody just stole it and passed, passed it off as their own. So I uh, looked up that paper that had used my sentence and found out that they, they had stolen a whole paragraph of text that I had written. But not only that, they had also stolen paragraphs from other scientists. And so they made this new paper based on a patchwork of all different types of sentences stolen from left and right and, and sort of glued that together into a new paper. And um, yeah, I was, yeah, I was angry and I was fascinated and I um, found more and more of these papers and I wrote to the editors and some of these papers got retracted. And so I felt, oh, I'm doing something good for science finally, <laughs> because I've worked in a lab for a long time. And I, I just felt this was, this was fascinating and very effective. And, yeah, uh, so that was about, uh, I don't know, that was in 2013. And so I, I was doing that this sort of as a hobby. And then one day I found out by accident while I was looking through a PhD thesis that had plagiarized text, I also found an image that had a little smudge, something I recognized. And then in another figure in the same chapter, they had used that same Western blot, that was what it was, that same thing with a little smudge uh, but upside down, and it represented a different experiment. And I got even more mad. This 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 person had plagiarized text and was also using Western blots, reusing them to represent different experiments. And this paper got it was a PhD thesis chapter, but it had also been published as a as a as a paper. And so I wrote to the to another editor in chief of that that journal, and that paper got retracted. And this was sort of successful, I guess, and then I um, decided to, to to scan more and more papers to see if I could find more duplicates because I realized I have this strange talent to recognize duplicated images. And it's actually, it's an amazing talent. I have been looking through <laughs> some of <laughs> <laughs> some of the images and I, I am so hard pressed to be able to recognize the uh, the patterns that you find within the images, um, and where you know coming from an academic background and lot, many people in in writing in general, you learn to look for plagiarism online and you learn to look for the copied text. But to be able to identify the copied not even whole images but little parts of images, what are the what are some of the lengths that people go to that you have uh, that you have seen in images? Oh, that, well, there's there's all kinds of duplications that I found. And 
Um, I do want to point out, I can only really find the tip of the iceberg. Only where people really leave traces of pho Photoshopping, I, I would be able to find it. If a person is a really good Photoshop, and I should not really say this because people might now know my, my tricks, but a really good Photoshopper, I would not be able to, to detect that. So what I detect are duplicates, so dupli duplicate parts of images. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I sort of scan an image and I'll, I'll my, let my eyes go over it and then maybe I'll pick up on a, on a duplicate. And I can remember maybe up to 20 or so images. So within a paper, I can look at the different panels and maybe I can recognize and compare a couple of other papers but I, I don't have the ability to remember all images ever published. I, I don't have any photographic yes. memory or so. So it, it is limited what I can do. And I'm sure software in the end, which is being developed now, is, is going to do better. But as of now, I can do a decent job in finding duplicates uh, between, um, yeah, some, uh, within a paper, for example. Do you think that uh, your uh, your training in microbiology gives you some of that uh, that pattern recognition? Do you think did did you spend a lot of time at the microscope identifying things uh, when you were training, or do you do you have anything that you think you can put your finger on? Um, no, I, I did not really look a lot through a microscope, which is maybe surprising for a microbiologist, but I'm the microbiologist yeah. who, who studied bacteria by looking at their DNA, so sequencing mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. And so I, I'm actually very bad in using a microscope. I think I learned it as a, as a college student, but I would not be able to, to get a decent <laughs> microscopy images right now. So, so no, that's not something I, I would be able to do now, but I, I've always seen patterns so when i go to a bathroom uh, in a in a restaurant or so i will look at the tiles and i'm like oh that tile is the same as that tile and but it's upside down or that tile is now rotated 90 degrees and yeah. i do the same i do the same with um laminate flooring you know where you have these uh, fake photos of of planks and and you sort of see the wooden pattern and and then you can just recognize that one plank is the same as the other plank and uh i've always assumed that everybody would see these patterns but i guess i'm i'm sort of the the odd person who who will uh, look at these things and is fascinated by them and and i'm now applying that for science so it's a little bit more useful than studying bathroom tiles for sure <laughs> although i'm <laughs> sure you would be amazing at puzzles <laughs> uh, i i don't think i'm pretty good at them um uh, more you know better than others but um i think i'm, I'm maybe i have just the the patient to to look at hundreds or thousands of papers and, and look for these things and i i sort of see it as a puzzle but then yeah. when people want me to play real puzzles i i don't know i, I just don't really find that useful <laughs> i find it more <laughs> useful to look at uh, puzzles in scientific <laughs> like, papers and do like, something wait a minute, I've got to, yeah i can look through these images and i can actually do something here yeah right, right. and you've um you've started the hashtag image forensics on twitter which has gotten a really amazing following um ha have you have you seen the community of people who are looking at images um in papers grow in the years since you've gotten started in this? Yeah, so so I'm part of a, a small group of people who, who focus on published papers. So we, we get lots of tips and we uh, or we, we have our own leads that we follow. But I, I hear more and more from people who have found these things independently of that, who, who are just reading a paper for their work and finding a duplicate or finding um, duplications while they're doing a peer review, for example. So I do think that the, the amount of people who, can, who, who recognizes these things is definitely growing. And I hope I've contributed a little bit by playing this game on Twitter and uh, just opening people's eyes. Like you, you, if, you, if you know what to look for, you'll find these things in, in the papers that you read. I know, I know by following your following your feed and following the following your hashtag I've I've tried my hand at things but I, I haven't found anything in any papers yet so but if I do <laughs> find something in a paper your advice is to do what to remain calm <laughs> and to not yell <laughs> misconduct 
So this is what I think a lot of people will immediately say, oh, this is misconduct. While in reality, a lot of these duplications might be honest errors, not all of them, may maybe only half of them. Uh, but you, you, it's hard to know from just looking at an image what really happened. So in, in a lot of cases, you're, you can say that it's a duplicate. So what I would recommend is to write to the editor in chief of the journal in which you have found this paper, uh, in this, this duplicate, and, and, and tell them about what, uh, what you found. And, but remain very objective. So just say, figure 2B looks remarkably similar to figure 5C. Uh, or there's an overlap with a little illustration. Um, unfortunately, I've done this a lot. I've reported around 4,000 papers by now. <laughs> and there's, <laughs> I know it's, it's a lot. I've scanned like probably 100,000 papers. But I really only look at the images, so I don't read the papers. So it's, 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 I don't really read them. I don't, should, should probably not be saying that, but uh, I only look at the images. And so I, I have reported a particular set of papers around 800 a couple of years back, five, six years back. And so I know what has happened to the, all these papers that I've reported to the editors in chief. And basically, with the majority of these papers, nothing happened. So I found these duplicates, I reported them and that the editor did not take any action. So only in 40% uh, of the cases did they either retract or correct the paper. So in the majority, there's just nothing that ha has happened to the, to the paper. And I found that a disservice to the scientific readers of these papers. So these papers usually cost a lot of money. And if you're part of a university, your university pays a lot of money for these papers and these journals. Yeah. And, and the journals should care about the quality. So I feel that if a reader raises a concern about a paper, the journals should take action. You know, if you buy a car and the wheel drops off uh, a year later, you, you would probably go back to the dealer and ask, <laughs> you know, what's up with that and can I get a new wheel? Uh, but yeah, it seems that a lot of journals don't really care about the quality of a paper after it has been published. So I'm taking things a lot online. So I uh, either take them to Twitter or I will uh, that's usually a sort of a last resort. But uh, I post most of the papers on a website called pubpeer.com. Mm -hmm. And I will um, uh, alert the reader that there's a potential problem with a paper. And then if people have a pubpeer extension, so they have plugins that will work with your browser, so you can do then a literature search. And if you have that plugin, it will tell you which papers have a comment. And you can click on that and see if there's a problem with the paper. Interesting. See, I would think that a lot of these journals would respond to your uh, your message with a job offer because <laughs> I feel like it would be very helpful to have someone with your skill set um, in charge of publishing papers. Uh, that would be wonderful, but uh, no, I actually want, would like to remain independent because I don't want to be working for sure. a boss ever again. Um, this, is, this is really good. <laughs> it's just fantastic to not have, a, have somebody telling me what to do. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, a lot of, and it's changing, but, but let's say five, six years ago, when I started this, this work, most journals did not even respond. Or they would say, well, thank you, Dr. Beck, we'll look into this. And then I would never hear anything again. Uh, and I sent them reminders once a year, like, what's up, uh, any updates? And they would just not respond to those. So I'm, I'm taking things online and I, I have even criticized big name journals for not responding to these things. And I think that is something that not a lot of scientists would dare to call out science or nature for not responding. I, it, it seems like it, somebody needs to take the journals to task. Uh, the, the system, the entire scientific endeavor, the ecosystem, um, it, there's a lot of toxic practices exactly. that that go on. Um, a study just out on um, the replica big replication studies has found that even though these replication studies are going on to find out the power of the original studies that were, were done in psychology, it doesn't matter. People are still citing the original studies. There are no commentary. There's nothing going on to the original studies giving them any kind of addendum or comment or, you know, just, hey, just a note, this other study was done that showed it it wasn't valid or um giving it any any sort of um any, any sort of warning sign i guess um but the publishers they want to publish and they're going to get money from libraries and they're going to get money from people who are 
subscribing to their services. And then you have the publishing, publish, 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 and perish within science. Um, do you see this kind of an effort um, as just one little step towards changing that ecosystem? Yes, I, I have noticed some some positive developments, but but I also realize that scientific publishing and I guess academia as a whole is just a extremely slow moving ship. It's it's yeah. not going to quickly shiftly change directions. It's going to take years and years. Um, I feel there's there's a lot of things wrong with scientific publishing. Um, uh, you know, like should peer review be done for free? Uh, and peer reviewers are not really educated to find fraud. They're they're educated. Or they're 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 supposed to find flaws in papers, but not necessarily fraud. And so that's not really their job to to do. And editors will will probably tell you that if they hire people like me who screen papers uh, for for image mistakes, and some journals actually do this, uh, and that's a good development. But but journals will tell you then we'll have to raise the price even more. And most academics will tell you, but we. We write the papers for free. We uh, peer review them for free. Where does all that money go to? And because pe papers are not being printed anymore. So it is tough to um, to see the amount of money we pay to academic publishing and at the same time realize that there's there seems to be little quality um, uh, control um, and, and lit, uh, yeah, not, not enough checks to, to check for these papers and check for these irregularities before publication. Where do you think the uh, the drive to uh, create paper mills comes from? Um, do you have any any thoughts on why there are groups of people just publishing, publishing, publishing these fraudulent papers that are getting going out? Yeah. yeah so paper mills is a very, uh, at least the ones I'm familiar with, are very specifically tied to um, medical doctors who work at hospitals in China, and that's mm -hmm. not because. People in China are more or less fraudulent than anywhere else, but it's because of a very particular requirement that these medical doctors, when they're done with their education and they want to work at a, at a hospital, they have a particular requirement that they have to publish one scientific paper. But they're not given any time off to do research, and they might not work in a hospital that has time or uh, a lab to do research in. So these are uh, mainly people who work in clinical hospitals, not associated with the academic hospital or academic institution. So they're not, they're, they're, you know, their focus is to cure patients, not to do research. And so it's, they're in a very hard situation where they have to publish a paper, but they don't have time or uh, opportunity to do so. And so those people uh, feel that the only way out of this, you know, this situation they're stuck in is to buy a paper. And so there are companies called paper mills who will offer papers for um, a, a big amount of money. And then authors will buy their authorship into one of these papers. And these papers are completely fake, at least that most of the ones we're finding. Um, the text is written through uh, with, uh, by ghostwriters on a template. The images are often stolen from other, Im other papers or are artificially generated, are not even real. And these papers are very hard to recognize as fake because each of these individual papers looks fine. I mean, maybe, you know, not really high quality, but, you know, decent. But if you compare a lot of these papers together, you, you will see that they have a very similar title structure, a very similar uh, images. Sometimes they reuse images. And so uh, it's only when you look at the bigger picture that you literally, that you see all these, uh, that all these papers come from the same studio. And so we, we're... Uh, together with, with a, a lot of other people, who most of them are anonymous, we're working on to find these uh, these paper mill papers and and uh, alert the editors that they should pay more attention, that there's just massive production of papers by almost like, uh, you know, organized crime type of organizations that will pump out these papers. That's fascinating that that this is even happening right now. There were uh, a couple of papers that came out. One paper, it, this is not so much paper mill as people publishing a paper with a, a, a particular slant. And it's whether, I'm wondering whether it's to get attention or whether it's actually to g give some kind of scientific credence to a the beginnings of a conspiracy theory or some kind of uh, idea that's meant to drive uh, people's 
perceptions. Um, and there was w- uh, one study on five that linked skin and 5G and COVID this last year that you uh, that you had uncovered and blogged about. Can you talk a bit about um, about what you found with that? Right. Yeah. So that was uh, like you said, a paper that claimed that 5G scary uh, would produce coronavirus from our skin and. If you're like, if your jaw is already on the floor, <laughs> that should be. So this paper got published in a, a PubMed index journal. So it sort of looked legit at first glance, yeah. uh, sort of passed all the quality controls. Um, but if you read the paper, it looked impressive. It had, uh, because it had a lot of formulas. Uh, now, so I'm the, the type of biologist. If I see a formula, I'm like, well, I have no idea what it means, but I'm sure it's impressive. And I think mm-hmm. that's what the peer reviewers thought. So it had, it was full of formulas and it's sort of those formulas were supposed to show that 5g caused coronavirus to burst out of your skin and uh, somebody rightfully asked the question well if if the 5g changes something in the cells of our dna the dna of our cells why doesn't it pr- produce a hundred dollar bill why does it specifically produce a coronavirus and that of course that wasn't answered in the paper and the whole paper was full of strange formulas and strange uh, graphs that but no there was no data and i would say if you have a fantastical claim you have to have fantastic data and there was no data in this paper and so um i wrote a blog post about it and the journal retracted it sort of silently i think they were uh, it's not a very good journal in which it was published obviously but um yeah Yeah. somehow it passed all the the quality control filters yeah, and uh, looking into the the authors, it seems the authors have published other very odd um, scientific claims in uh, in other papers as well. So there's a history of kind of pushing a a fringe science uh, perspective, right? Yeah. Anyway, I I just wonder if you know it is something like that. The pa- the paper got retracted but is something like that is that just that that researchers urge for attention or is that is that something else do you think that there is the possibility with paper mills with journals that maybe aren't great quality but get published in pub pub med that there might be the possibility if we're not looking closely enough of it being used to like i said give credibility to not credible ideas uh, that's a tough question, and I think in this particular case, I would still blame it on some persons with strange ideas who found each other and just pushed out papers because they they love doing that. I I hope there's no agenda behind it, but I'm sure it, those papers will be misused by people who have a either a very yeah like a strong five anti five G agenda. I'm sure they'll find this paper and they'll they'll use it for that purpose. So. I, I I hope that it, it was not an organized action, but there's a lot of people with strange ideas, um, as we have all realized in the past year, and and they will try to. They're convinced that scientists are uh, are are not giving them a voice, and they'll find some topic, some a platform to publish their ideas in. So whether or not that's completely organized or just the result of all the misinformation that we hear around us. And all the mistrust that we that that people seem to have in science, that I don't know. But uh, there's definitely a lot of strange papers that somehow have passed peer review, and I, I feel that we should be more on the lookout for those things, and we should be um, ensuring a better quality of publications. So I, my question I for the general public then would be: If I'm going to pretend I'm I'm somebody who's not accustomed to reading scientific papers at all, how do I? both maintain faith in the scientific process while also maintain a healthy skepticism of the information that I receive off the internet about the latest publication? Well, usually you'll, I tend to look at the the quality of the journal in which things were published, but even that is not a guarantee. We've seen some big retractions in big name papers uh, in the past year. And so um, it's it's really hard to give a hundred percent foolproof. You know, this is what you should do to trust the paper. But in general, if things can be replicated, that's always a good sign. Um, if, um, for example, the hydroxychloroquine paper uh, that I wrote a big critique on, 
that paper has not really been able to be replicated by, by other studies. And so I think that's a sign that that paper maybe is not a good paper. And um, But it's, it's hard to give that. Uh, in general, I still believe that most science is to be trusted, but there will always be these, these odd outliers that um, uh, fall through the cracks and that, that, that get out there and, and that just have not been peer reviewed. Uh, very well. And that is why I'm a firm believer of post-publication peer review. I feel once a paper is published, you should allow other scientists to, to be critical of it and to write critiques about it. And so that's why I make a lot of use of Papier. So probably my guess would be go to Papier and see if there's, people have written critiques about the paper and, and, and see if you can trust it. And um, that might be the only way to uh, to really advise it, but it's it's hard for even for scientists to know what is true. Uh, some papers just look real and turn out to be completely fake, but that is only a small fraction of papers. Yeah, I really think that it. There are so many papers being published right now, and that is really it's the information overload when right. the scientific community is. These are the people who have to read the papers and the the. Uh, you know, if you are an expert in a particular niche area, read the papers in that area and tell other people what you think about them. Are they good? Are they bad? And you have to be able, be willing to speak about them or criticize them if they are not good so that that information can percolate out to other communities who maybe are not the experts, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Time to get that information out. Is there anything else that uh, you want to say about scientific integrity and the work that you're doing currently that you think people should understand? Um, yeah, well, it's it's not always easy to do what I do. I, I do receive a lot of criticism. So uh, uh, right now there is a threatening lawsuit, <laughs> like a lawsuit that uh, I might get because I criticize the work of, uh, of a particular scientist. And so... It is not always easy work. It's, it could be even dangerous work. And I, I feel that I am a scientist who criticizes papers, but I don't try to attack uh, the persons behind, you know, the, the authors. I don't try to make it personal. And uh, it's it's tough that I receive these ad hominem attacks, uh, you know, on the way I look or the way I talk or the way, uh, you know, my whole history. While in reality, we should be talking about the papers that I'm criticizing. and. Uh, I feel that these lawsuits are sort of trying to silence me and that's not how science should work. And I do hope, and I know that there's a lot of support for what I do, but it's, it is a tough situation to be in. So it's, um, I hope that that will change in the future, that we'll be able to freely speak and criticize and, and, and uh, you know, build upon each other's papers without the, 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 to having to be afraid that we'll be sued for, for that. What happened to the free scientific enterprise and right. free inquiry? <laughs> I know, that, that is what I was promised when I started this career, but it did not quite happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much for doing what you do. And for our audience and uh, people who are out there, you do have a Patreon account. Is it, uh, is it just your, your name? To if it's people are interested. Elizabeth Vick, I, I don't want to ask people for money, but uh, if, if okay. people have $1 one dollar to spare, yes, I am on Patreon. Elizabeth Vick is my handle, I guess. Thank you. Wonderful. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, I think this is, uh, the work that you do is very valuable. And, you know, until the AI come in and, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the robots take your job, um, right. <laughs> which <laughs> potentially, maybe that'll be a good thing if, uh, you know, if large databases of, of images can be right, assessed, right. you know, more right. rapidly. But um, until then, uh, your work is very important. And thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. It's just thank wonderful you. to speak yeah. with you. Thank you for having me on. It was my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and before you go, where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter. Uh, so my handle is Microbiome Digest. And it's not microbiome with an E at the end because Twitter did not allow all, all the letters that I wanted in there. So I had to drop a letter and it became the E. So it's microbiome digest, but you can also search for my name. There's only, as far as I know, one Elizabeth Vick on Twitter with an S, not with a Z. And uh, yeah, that's me. So I hang out a Fantastic. lot. Fantastic. 
way too much time on Twitter. So you can find me there. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> yeah, we all. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. I hope you get some rest from your work and um, I will see you on Twitter again soon. Yes, we'll see you there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Everyone, this is This Week in Science and we are going to take a very quick break. When we come back, it'll be time for Blair's Animal Corner. Da, da, da. And this is where we cut and we chop. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It was wonderful. I will, um, I'm gonna remove you from the screen if you're ready to go. Okay, bye, have a wonderful night. I will send you links and things tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. Have a great, great night. Bye. All righty. And I turn my computer back on for the music. Thank you for listening to Twist. If you like this show, please consider, consider heading to our website, twist.org, and clicking on our Patreon link. For Patreon supporters with who support us at $10 or more per month, we will thank you by name at the end of the show. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. And now it is time for the show section that has lots of animals in it. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, little pet, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? <gasps> oh, good, you said it. <sighs> Breathe. It's okay. Let's do that. Okay. Do All right. Okay. <sighs> so, if you're a if you're a monkey, um, if you're a tamarind, very adorable, tiny little monkey that lives in rainforest. So and you're in, a, you're in a new territory. You don't belong there. You haven't been there before. In fact, other tamarins live there. How do you get through safely? Well, if you were a pied tamarin, um, which is a critically endangered species, has one of the smallest ranges of any, any primate in the world, you might sometimes have to go through red-handed tamarin territory. They are found throughout the northeastern Amazon region. And when the, um, the other way around, when the red-handed tamarins enter the territory of the pied tamarins, other way. So these, these pied tamarins that have their teeny tiny territories, they don't want to give it up, right? When these red-handed tamarins that are all over the Amazon. Wait, 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 wait. They, wait, what, what tamarins? The first ones? Pied. Oh, pied tamarins. Tamarins with their teeny tiny territories. There was a lot yes. of alliteration there. Okay, yes. thank you. Teeny tiny, ta teeny tiny tamarind territory. Um, when the red-handed tamarins move into the pied tamarind territory, the red-handed tamarins adopt the calls used by pied tamarins. So um, this is the first asymmetric call convergent Sh convergence shown in primates. So that means this is the first time ever that it has been recorded that one species chooses to adopt another species call pattern to communicate. They're not uh, merging. They're not cross communicating both ways. Just one species going, don't mind me. It's just another pied tamarind walking through. <laughs> and so um, they, there are a few th reasons that researchers think this is the case. First and foremost, red-handed tamarins have greater vocal flexibility. So the likelihood that they could even do this is high. They also use calls more often than pied tamarins. So they just talk more. So that also would make you think that their brain would have more kind of elasticity around calls and stuff like that. So scientists believe that they alter their calls to avoid territorial disputes over resources. Unclear as to whether they're trying to get through unnoticed as a pied tamarind, or if they're trying to speak to pied tamarins in their own lingo. Could be either, 
But ultimately what we know is happening here is they all of a sudden are sounding like a Pied Tamarin when they enter Pied Tamarin territory. That is so tricky. Yeah. That's sneaky. Yeah. I'm like, I, 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 I am respecting the tamarins a little bit more. I mean, the pied tamarin does a little yes. look a little bit diabolical. <laughs> so I used to maybe you do want to fit in. Yeah. <laughs> I used to work with these tamarins and they are wild creatures. And yes, they are critically endangered. There's so few of them left. Um, but yeah, tamarins in general, I would encourage... Anyone who has five minutes and isn't actively driving right now to Google pictures of tamarins because there really isn't an interest, a not interesting looking one. Every sim single type of tamarin is cute or weird or interesting looking in some way. So just as an aside, check that out. That's my little piece of advice to all of you <laughs> on your internet <laughs> wasting that you'll do because everyone's going to waste some time on the internet today, guaranteed, right? Just look at tamarins. Anyway. Point being, <laughs> um, th this is a really unusual, interesting way for species to communicate with each other. And um, yes, they are both primates. Yes, they are both monkeys. Yes, they are both tamarins. And yes, they are very closely related. But this is still very cool. It's, it's you know... It's Go very ahead. cool. I mean, not just paying attention to a another a conspecifics uh, call, but being able to mimic that call, being able to uh, blend in, being able to ah, okay, it's you know, it's the ventriloquist act or the you know or the American going to uh, England and pretending to be Canadian, eh? Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember for a while they were telling you, if you travel overseas, put a Canadian flag on your backpack. Anyway, um, yeah, it is so, like that. Eh? But it's it? also kind of more like yeah. walking through the zoo and making a call like a chimp as you pass the chimp exhibit. Because <laughs> it's a different species. Yep. So it's... <laughs> It's it it kind of is like learning a language before you go into a country, but it's kind of more like mimicking the sounds of a language you don't understand completely and passing, which I think passing. is really crazy. So the question now is do these animals understand mm -hmm. the sounds that they're making? Right? Do they understand each other? Do they understand mm -hmm. the sounds they're making to the pied tamarins? Do the pied tamarins understand the sounds? Yes. That the red-handed tamarins the, are making. I think that is a very important question. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Is it just mimicry or is it actually picking up the other language? Right. And then Goodness. I can't help but wonder with our fairly poor human ears. When we go into a habitat and we think we're hearing certain things, are we always hearing those animals? Or sometimes are we hearing other animals mimicking those animals? That's a great question. I don't it's, know. <laughs> you know, I just, I watched <laughs> crows gotta, fighting a red-tailed no. hawk the other day, and it didn't occur to me until right this second that crows are capable of a lot of sounds. Do you think oh, a crow I has a... ever mimicked a red-tailed hawk? I have a starling that lives in my house that mimics so many, it mimics the crows, it mimics the song sparrow, it mimics a the the bird of prey that lives nearby, It all of them, this starling mimics all of them. And so every, I have caught myself going, oh, I wonder if there's an osprey in the neighborhood. No, no, no. it's a starling. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh darn starlings. Um, yeah, so then you have to, you have to separate out um, mimicry versus communication. Is this mimicry that we're he hearing in these tamarins or is it communication? Yeah. Yep. Then when you look further out in the animal, which, 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 anyway. Lots which of one is here. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one is it? Which one is it? And moving from monkeys to wolves. Um, wolves in deer territory, which one is it? Prey? Or savior. <laughs> so this is looking, this is a study um, looking at both Michigan and Wisconsin and the impact of gray wolves on deer 
populations. So specifically looking at Michigan's Upper Peninsula, wolves moved in in the 1990s and 2000s. And what happened? Deer collisions went way down. So deer were getting hit by cars less. Coincidence? Good question. Where so there another... are fewer deer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? Um, so another team of scientists gathered data about road collisions and wolf movements in Wisconsin. And they looked there and found that, in fact, what was happening was wolves were creating a, quote, landscape of fear. So once wolves colonize a county, deer vehicle collisions go down about 24% which is not nothing. That is a good chunk. And um, it is partially the thinning of the population, which as we know is not always a bad thing. Sometimes there's too many deer and it makes deer sick, it reduces their resources. It's actually a problem for deer if there's too many of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one piece, but the other piece is behavioral changes. Wolves, it turns out, use linear features of a landscape as travel corridors. Things like, you know, roads, <laughs> also pipelines, stream beds, but they will use these linear pathways to move through a habitat. And so deer learn very quickly to avoid those linear features when wolves move in, which means they stay away from the road. Wow. So the presence of wolves uh, obviously is... Um, looked down upon by ranchers because wolves eat livestock. And so there's all sorts of um, data being collected and being looked at at the financial implication of livestock losses to wolves because then we're stuck doing a cost benefit analysis as a government of which is worse, the loss of the habitat or the loss of the livestock. Don't get me started on how we shouldn't be living off so much livestock anyway. But ultimately, that is a conversation that the government has to have because they have to decide, is it beneficial to keep the wolves? And this is why wolves were eradicated from the United from most of the United States pretty early in westward expansion of Europeans is because the wolves were getting at the livestock. But a 2008 study from the U.S. Department of Transportation estimated that crashes from hitting deer cost more than $8 billion annually. So if you can reduce that, then it actually might be more financially beneficial <laughs> to let the wolves stay, even if they're taking some, some cows and sheeps here, here and there. Um, but the other kind of unknown ecologic or economic impact, which is what I always gets me stuck in, I get stuck in the fact that we're, we're really not good at quantifying the cost of things really in an environment, but wolves are also reshaping ecosystems as Justin loves to bring up. I know he'd talk about it if he were here, the whole Yellowstone situation, right? So there's a huge benefit to ecosystems, very hard to measure that economically. But if you think about collisions, you have this $8 billion, but that's not even counting medical bills, fatalities, and other things that happen as a result of these collisions. This is really just looking at like, if a vehicle's destroyed, if a road is messed up, if, if, um, if a roadway gets blocked for a period of time, it's looking at a lot of infrastructure-y type things. It's not really looking at the human element when it's looking at that cost. So this is potentially something that could be really helpful to know for wolf management and wolf advocacy in the United States. And just as a quick little Wolves parallel, are good for cars. <laughs> yeah, turns out. Turns um, out. In 2016, actually, there was a study done that found that cougars decreased the number of deer vehicle crashes in part of the eastern U.S. by about 22%, so a very similar number. So this is tracking with that same number, that same rough number. And so um, if that's the case, having natural predators around just by the nature of them being there can help alleviate this really, uh, this pretty big problem. And, you know, I grew up in the city. I, I didn't almost ever have to worry about hitting a deer until I started going to school in a more rural area, area for college. Um, but there are lots of places in this country um, where people are scared to drive 
late at night or early in the morning and it's kind of nerve wracking because if you hit a deer, it could be the end of your car um, or the end of your life potentially. It's it's really dangerous. So um, yep. that's it, it's very good to know that there are natural solutions for this. <laughs> there are natural solutions to the problem yeah. of hitting deer with your car. Who knew? Yeah. And it doesn't involve going out and hunting deer necessarily. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Let, and let and the so wolves do that. Large carnivores have an ecological and economic value. That's yes. really what this is about is, again, the whole ecosystem. You think about the whole system thinking, the package, right? We get so tied up in our little details that we lose sight of the big mm-hmm. picture and the whole system and the system is essential, the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Right. Systems thinking is pretty important. Yeah, very important. I hope we get to go back to uh, uh, the the Center for the Institute for Complexity the um, in Santa Fe. They do a lot of oh, yeah. systems thinking there. Oh, I can't um, wait to go back to Santa Fe. Yeah. Yes. After COVID, we get to After go COVID. back. AC after COVID. Yeah. BC AC. This is the new the new dividing line for modern society. This is this week in science. And I've got some stories. Yay! I've got a story about stimulating sight. Really interesting study. So we've talked previously about uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa and how it leads to deterioration and event of vision and eventual blindness. And there really are not many uh, treatments for it. And researchers have been trying to come up with various ways to treat the disease, whether it's um, been gene modification or uh, whether it's drugs or whether it's, hey, you're going to get a cybernetic eye. There's all sorts of things. And researchers just published from the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Basel in Nature Medicine on the first evidence of a giving a person who has retinitis pigmentosa, partial vision, partial recovery of vision with optogenetic treatment. (coughs) Excuse me. And now optogenetic treatment is when we put light-sensitive molecules into cells. And I've talked about it on the show many times with respect to mice and controlling cells in mouse brains getting mice to do different things. And usually it's a uh, a rhodopsin, it's a light sensitive protein, a light sensitive uh, molecule that responds to blue light. But in this particular case, this 58 year old man was injected with a uh, a vector of a virus vector, an adeno associated viral vector that then put, this channel rhodopsin crimson R into his eye. And it took several months of this uh, this vector to actually incorporate this new molecule into the light sensing cells in the retina of this man's eye. This, this molecule originally came from an algae, Chlamydomonas noctigama. And so now from algae to vision, this man went from not being able to detect any light at all to being able to to be able to at least locate on a table objects. He can't see them distinctly necessarily, but as opposed to being 100 percent in the dark, he's now able to make out uh, shapes on a a surface and be able to identify them. And the really interesting trick to this, though, is that even though this channel rhodopsin, Crimson R, it doesn't respond to blue light, it responds to red light. And it won't just respond to sunlight, even though there's a bit of red red in sunlight, there's not a lot. Um, They have to put special goggles 
on the person. So um, the people who get this treatment have to wear have to wear goggles, and the goggles then take the visual signal and send red light and wash the retina in red light so that the photosensitive cells are then activated and allow the person to see. So it's a combination of molecular technology in addition to actual physical technology, goggles plus special chemical in your eyes, and suddenly you can see. Suddenly, you can see. Would you, if uh, you could get a chemical that would get rid of your color blindness, if you had it injected into your eyes, do you think that you would do that? Or would you stick with what you've got? Uh, 100% yes, until you said the word injected into your eyes. <laughs> I think that one's tough because I I won't even get... Um, LASIK because it scares me to have I just I have a thing about my eyes it's it creeps me out but if I could yes if I could get color vision back it would it would make my life so much easier I gotta tell you <laughs> you're like that would be great let's do it <laughs> yeah it's I mean I don't think a day goes by that somebody doesn't use a color identifier for something to me and I often have to be like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that color. Yeah. 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 Well, this research is very cool. It's just a uh, few people so far that they have uh, started this trial with, with this optogenetic technique. And uh, they've treated a few more people, found that it worked okay. They weren't able to do the face-to-face -face testing because of COVID. So, but they did re determine that it was safe, that the dosage they were giving was safe. And they are now doing additional tests with increased dosage to see if they can get a better response with more cellular recruitment, with more of this uh, light-sensitive protein getting into the retinal cells, and with better light detection and better vision. So Maybe one day there will be people, and maybe they won't need goggles one day. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a, a, a different world. Yeah. And then That's, the final. So cool. I know. It's, it's amazing. This is, I mean, this kind of this kind of science where it's like co combining, you know, it, it's just it's very futuristic. I'm like this is well, and just I mean, I was I was sitting there <laughs> thinking about having no vision at all, and then suddenly having. The difference between light and dark and and some just kind of crude shapes would be, it would be a complete game changer. It would completely change your life. Totally. Yep. Yep. You'd be able to actually get around your house more easily. Like just <laughs> basic tasks would be so much easier. So much yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah. So more tests to come and they uh, are, are calling this new technique, this new kind of information. And the, the way that it worked, it took a long time for it to start working. And the, the, the subject had to start really learning how to see again. And so what they're calling it, the clinicians are now calling it with a, a whole new name because no one's ever done this before. And so it's a new scientific field that they're calling visual rehabilitation. Awesome. Yeah. Brand new. Awesome. Field. This is this is what the 2000s was supposed to bring. This. Yes. This is exactly the this yeah, just a little bit lens, late, but you know, we're here. The artificial it's not even that late. We're still in the first half. This is, <laughs> it's the the artificial limbs that can interface with your brain and this this is exactly I forget the flying cars. I don't need that. This is what we need. <laughs> I don't need those. <laughs> Just give me all the adaptations. Yes. I need that. I need that extra thumb from last week's show. Yeah, and <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. um, and my last story for the night has to do with memories. Mm. Oh, the details fade over the t over time, don't they? They sure do. <laughs> they just fade, and we know, like we've heard from researchers through the years that 
if you access your memories over and over and over again, that it's that accessing of memories that maybe overwrites them a little bit and kind of muddies them up. But a new study that was just published in Nature Communications kind of explains the the reasoning behind why they become less vibrant. And the the gist is that we remember the gist. We don't re- remember the details that we don't need to remember. And so they had a number of individuals in this study look at these visual images and they had to, uh, they were prompted to recall certain aspects of the image that were either very detailed oriented or um, more more meaning related. So they had word image pairs and they were supposed to say, for example, if the com- co- if the image was colored or grayscale, which is more perceptual, or whether it showed an animate or an inanimate object, which is more semantic or meaningful. And then they tested them right after they were trained and then tested them again two days later. And they found that the participants, surprise, surprise, were faster at rec- at recalling the semantic details the perceptual elements just those were not they're they're just perceptual and they were not important and the researcher says it's kind of like imagine that you're reminiscing about a, a dinner with a friend before covid <laughs> and you realize you can't remember what the the table decor was but you do know what you ordered while you had dinner with your friend or you remember a conversation with a bartender but you don't remember the color of the shirt the bartender was wearing or you you know you're like oh it was a green shirt or a red shirt i'm not quite sure and they say this pattern towards recollection of meaningful semantic elements we demonstrate in this study indicates that memories are biased toward more meaningful content in the first place And we've shown in previous studies, this bias is clearly reflected in brain signals, too. Our memories change with time and use, and that is a good and adaptive thing. We want our memories to retain the information that is most likely to be useful in the future when we encounter similar situations. So it's whatever means the most in the moment. What are you going to remember about tonight's show, Blair? (laughs) <laughs> probably what semantic something about aspects? injecting into your eyeballs <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and also that all those pictures that uh that our guest said looked the same looked different to me <laughs> <laughs> i could i didn't have the i didn't have the yeah, eye for it yeah. Um, you're not you're not going to remember the the color of different people's no. shirts or yeah no, no, no that's color. that's actually a thing my my brain doesn't store color cuz it can't trust it i right. have a whole i have a whole theory about this so yeah i have i have no memory for color so that's actually kind of related to this right so it is absolutely so i do think my brain knows it's not relevant cuz it's probably not right <laughs> so if i assume something is a certain color Unless I am verbally, unless it's confirmed that it's a certain color. Then, so for example, I have really good memory for what color articles of clothing are when I am told. So when I go shopping or when I buy something and I come home, I ask somebody, what color is this? I have a really good memory that that sweater is blue because I was told it was blue. But yeah, in terms of, in terms of just kind of like an environment that I'm in, I have no memory for colors at all. (laughs) <laughs> I'd love to know what kind of details people out there have memories for. Do you have photographic memories or are you more of a gist person like yeah. me? I'm, I'm more a, of gist a gist person. person. I'm a gist person. Anyway, science, it gives you the gist. And I think we're done with the show. Did we make it to the end, Blair? Oh, we did. Look at that. <laughs> we did it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's it's 931. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Well, I do want to thank Dr. Elizabeth Bick for joining us on the show tonight. It was wonderful to have you on the show. And as a reminder to our audience out there, you can find her on Twitter. You can uh, find her blog. We will have links at our website, twist.org. 
um, as well. And oh my goodness, I guess I, it's time for me to say thank you to people. I do like saying thank you. Thank you, Blair, for a great show. Oh, thank you, Kiki, for hosting. <laughs> and my shout outs, shout outs to Fada for help with social media and with show notes with Gord for manning our chat room, which may be changing soon. We'll have a conversation after the show. And Identity 4 for recording the show. Rachel for your amazing assistance. And I would love to thank our Patreon sponsors for being our Patreon sponsors for all of the support that they give us. Thank you to John Ratnaswamy, Kira, Carl Kornfeld, Melanie Stegman, DeCramsta, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chefstad, House Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Shu Brew, Darwin Handen, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Marshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, Jack. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rapp and Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Rails back flying out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood. This profile name is hilarious in the context of some other podcast. Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson. Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drabo, Drapo, Sarah Chavis, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And yes, and if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon... You can head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. And on next week's show, we have an interview scheduled with Dr. Kate Clancy and Dr. Katie Lee. We will be talking about women's reproductive issues, <gasps> their study into the COVID-19 vaccine and how it's influencing menstrual issues and women in science it should be a lot of fun you ready blair for next week i'm ready i'm gonna get my my uh pink hat uh warmed up i'm ready to go <laughs> All right. um yeah i'm ready we'll be back on wednesday at 8 p.m pacific time broadcasting live from youtube and facebook and from twist.org slash live twist.org slash live you know what i just did i wasn't reading a lot that's fine i'm good i'm still gonna go want to listen no. to us as a podcast <laughs> <laughs> just for, for this week in science wherever podcasts are found if you enjoyed the show get your press and subscribe as well <laughs> for more information on anything you've heard here today show notes and links to stories will be available at our website that's at www.twist.org and you can also sign up for our newsletter you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion dot at gmail.com, or Blair at Bear, BlairBaz at twist.org. Just put twists in the subject line so your email does not get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also ping us on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson. Whoa, at Dr. Kiki. I'm going too fast. At Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address or suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. And we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything at all from the show tonight, Remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming.
coming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science This week in science science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science 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 And that's the show We've made it to the after show Yeah Is the show over? Yeah but is it really over? No. I mean, that depends. It depends. I mean, Blair's in a helmet. <laughs> it's the after show. Yeah. After, after, after. This one with frizzy hairs back here. They're doing what they want to do. Yeah, um, let me fin- fix my hair. Yeah, fix your hair, Blair. I mean. <laughs> there we go. I've done it. There we go. It's too big for my head. Is it? I can't yeah, it tell fits, from here. <laughs> it fits Brian a lot better. <sighs> this is not the way, you know? It's not the way? Do you know the way? Not the way. <laughs> Do you know the way? Do you know the way? Do you? This show is forever. We are everyone. Um, so we have our chat rooms on YouTube and Facebook and Twitch, all over the places at the different video places. And we used to have a live stream from YouTube that went to our twist.org website. And what has happened? Well, the live stream to the twist.org website doesn't work anymore because YouTube did something. And Oh, no. It- it broke, so there's no video there at the live page anymore. Oh, shoot. But there's a I've chat been room. People the wrong place. <laughs> it's okay. I have links. There are links to YouTube and Facebook and Twitch on that page, so people can find the live links okay. if they haven't done so before. It's just an easy place to send people to find it. But we have that's kind of an easy way also to get into our free node web chat. 
which has been twist chat home for a long time um that uh gourd has taken care of gold zader others have have fostered and kept it nice and happy and safe um and so question there's apparently some stuff happening with free node that people are not happy about i don't know the politics of it really but it doesn't sound great uh, but there are a lot of free node communities that are very unhappy at the moment. Ah, YouTube keeps updating their SDK. That's why it keeps breaking. Yep, exactly. Yes, but you are still there in the free node web chat. So should we move to another IRC, like Liberia chat? Or... Should we say, hey, everyone, go chat on Twitch or YouTube or I, mean, I, I want to do what the community wants to do. And I know not everybody is going to have the same ideas. Those of you that are on YouTube right now, you're on YouTube, chatting away on YouTube. Those of you who are on Facebook or on Twitch are doing that as well. And that's great. I want everyone to be able to be happy. And I can see you all right now, which is awesome. I see all of you. But mm -hmm. uh <laughs> I can see you. I see. I see you. But what should we do? Where should we go? Do people? Uh, Gord said he'd like to get rid of a chat client. Do you want to get rid of cl chat clients, peoples? Do you like your chat clients? Do, do you know where you are happy? I want to. I want everyone to be happy. I cannot make everyone happy, but I will do my best. Yes, Fada saying 14 employees of Freenode quit over a takeover that has happened. Are they f employees or volunteers? But any, it doesn't matter much if they're doing the work. <laughs> Gord, Gord says, we have a ludicrous number of chat rooms already. Wouldn't mind losing the IRC. Twitch has emotes. It's true. And you're using them. It's great. Kevin Jones is happy in YouTube. I'm happy here in my happy house. My happy walls. I think I need to listen to some Susie and the Banshees soon. Fada says a bit of both. Yeah, Fada, what do you use? <laughs> C.E. Smith, no, I don't keep track of when you're sleeping. No, that's not something I do. I feel like you can't see my facial expression, so I had to. I can't see you. You're what? Are you making faces at me this whole time? I was. That's okay. Anyway, uh, right? There's Discord work. as well, um, and there is a Twist Discord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I keep, I'm so bad at Discord. I keep forgetting. <laughs> how to get in <laughs> i'm like i have an account i don't remember how to i haven't get tried in. to log into discord in a long time yeah I'm like, i don't know how to log in okay fada's probably moving to liberia discord will have advertising in the near future mm -hmm. um yeah you can give us bits on twitch it's true oh you get buffering huh but there's always YouTube. If you don't, but you don't have to watch on YouTube. Where do you watch? Thunder Beaver. Here an op on hashtag twist on Liberia dot chat. Okay, so there is a an IRC at Liberia. Twitch ch Twitch chat. Okay, Gord says for those who are really married to the IRC clients, Twitch chat is IRC based will play relatively nicely with IRC clients. So that's good. Hot Rod says Twitch or Facebook or YouTube, which we already use. So no change. Okay, good. I just don't, I don't want people to feel left out. Like if this, I mean, if everyone decides to leave the free node chat, we can close it and, um, 
do the other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know. Do you have an opinion, Blair? I think it all depends on if I can interact with these other chats through mm -hmm. StreamYard. So I'm going to I'm going to sign up for an account today and see if that does something. I want to hit sign up for free, but I'm afraid it's going to boot me from this discussion. <laughs> right. If you did it right now. Uh, if I did it right now. So I'm not going to try it, but I'll try it before next week's show. And then if I can we'll interact see. with YouTube and um, and Twitch and Facebook through this, then it yeah. would actually be a lot easier if I only was looking in one place instead of two places. Yep. Yep. So that would be my personal preference is to reduce the number of windows I have to check while I'm also supposed to be paying attention to what's going on. Um, so that's my personal opinion is uh, okay. I'm, I'm sad to see the web, the IRC go cause we've been there forever. But um, if, if we, if we have enough coverage and I see people are in both places sometimes, you know, it's kind of yeah. it would be nice to just have one less Please. Yeah. Omnipresent. Yes. Identity for. <laughs> Let's see. Identity for is in Discord, YouTube, and YouTube. You're in YouTube and YouTube? How are you in YouTube and YouTube? The marked is in Twitch. Yeah, I, what is this? What is uh So anyway, I I, I will do what y'all want to do. Um Thunder Beaver proposes even more bridging IRC Twitch Discord XMPP chats together. Hi how? Oh, no. Yeah, many orgs have moved to Discord from IRC. You use IRC for your Twitch chat. Oh, interesting. Because, like Gord was saying, it can do that. Okay, Fada says Discord and Liberia. Whatever folks choose. I mean, we can just, we can say, I mean, if there's a hash, if there's a twist chat over at Liberia, if everybody, I mean, there's so many options. I know, Eric Knapp. Oh, my goodness. So many options. Um, so Identity4 is mentioning making sure, like, it would be cool to have an offline room. Like, the Discord is that, right? I just, like, I hadn't logged in in probably a year. Oh, yeah. uh, but having an offline room is neat. Right. It would be nice also for people to send us story ideas there and stuff. There's lots of other ways for people to send us stuff, but I, you know, in, in Twitter, it kind of falls down the line sometimes if you don't yes. get to it right away. So um, it would be cool to just be like, oh, I'm looking for stories. What's in the Discord? <laughs> because I think, isn't that what um, DTNS does? I think that's what DTNS mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Yeah. They get story ideas. They have a Reddit and mm, a they Discord. Were Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be twist offline. It would be. We can live stream to 100 people. Yes. If, okay. Can I post how you can log into the Discord chat for twists? Yes, because so far I think it's only, I've, posted it a couple like once or twice before but it was only um it was oh no okay i have to remember how to get into it <laughs> give me a moment uh let's see give me a moment to discover do 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 when I downloaded Discord to this computer, I guess I did. I think download. it's just called Twist. Did I just call it Twist? I think so. Okay. 
Okay, let's see if I can get in here. <laughs> Something's going on here. Yes. Okay. Yes, something is going on here. Send me an email, Discord. Hey, Meow Meow. How are you doing, kitten? What else is going on in the world? Today was what? It was World International Otter Day? I don't know. I don't have the calendar near me. <laughs> you otter. I otter. You're you right. otter have a calendar. I got uh, convinced when we moved to put the calendar in the kitchen so we could look at it more often, which is nice, but I need it near the computer. <laughs> yes. Can you tell me funny otter stories? Uh, you know any? Yeah. So, uh, so river otters, um, when they are in uh, captivity... For some reason, they have a proclivity for sucking on glass. What? So you can see, here, let me pull up pictures. You can see all these pictures of otters, like, sucking and licking the glass um, at exhibit, which is very funny. Oh, here, my goodness. I can, I'm going to scream share this. Scream shim. Scream shim? You're going to scream shim. Scream this. shim. Scream shim jibs. Jibs shim shim. Scream shim. It's happening. <laughs> Scream shim. Uh... Okay, I'm trying to screen share. Haha, ha, that was the otter day. You too. Weka, 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 weka. Yeah, there is an, there is an otter story. Oops, there's your scrim shim. Yeah, there's my scrim shim. Scrim shim strim. Yeah, so this is a thing they do. And when oh, I... Oh, I was imagining that they were finding, like, river glass in the rivers. And no, they're sucking no, on the enclosure the glass. that they do, in fact, do. And when I worked <laughs> in the Aquarium of the Bay, they started doing this. This is Aquarium of the Bay, I think, this picture, actually. Um, yeah, this is... Look at this is Aquarium of the Bay too, I think. Look at it. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that face. <laughs> it's insane. Um I don't know what it is. Something about the sensation <laughs> is fun for them or so I don't know. I wish I could <sighs> open image and new tab. Can I there we go. Can oh I... my goodness. Give me this. <laughs> that is I, uh, hold I on. can't even with that. Can Why? I... Somebody has to study this. Here, I have to. I uh, this is frustrating. I thought it would follow me, but it didn't. Oh, hot rod! You, Watch, you put the link this. in there, didn't you? That's good. Look at I'm this. Still waiting for Discord to email me. Oh God. Okay, here it is. I got it. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those sharp teeth and that yeah, waggly yeah. tongue. So they're so oh, they're oh, um, oh, mustelids. Oh, oh, oh. They're weasels. So they have, um, they have like the um, razor sharp Cuisinart in their mouth. Um, so river otters and sea otters, um, one of the big differences that they have is that um, the river otters are in the river and the sea otters in the sea. Got it? Okay, great. Got no, it. river Good. otters um, are river primarily otters are fresh. in the sea. It's like how a driveway and a roadway are completely yeah. different. No, yeah. what? They're primarily freshwater um, and they swim and they will haul out on land to eat a lot um, and they can walk on land really well. So they're like, they can like rotate their, their feet forward and they can run pretty well. Um, sea otters are terrible at running. They look very silly when they try to do it um, and they eat on their back and they're primarily seawater. They also, sea otters get really big. A lot of people don't realize sea otters can be like six feet long. What? <laughs> Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And um, in both cases, you should never, ever, ever go anywhere near an otter because, as I mentioned, they are mustelids. They are, uh, they have very sharp teeth and very sharp claws. They are predators and they are extremely territorial. So, um, just like all 
uh, weaselly things. They have a scent gland that they mark, and they so they're extremely careful about their territory. So when humans are in their territory, they have been known to um, get in altercations with humans, and um, you can get hospitalized by an otter. So I would just say, be careful. Don't go near otters if you see them in the wild. Um, and uh, oh, and the other really cool thing about otters is that they uh, have some of the thickest fur in the animal kingdom, which is why they were almost all gone at one point. We hunted them all. <laughs> um, and so uh, the reason it's so thick is that they have this extremely, extremely thick, fuzzy, soft undercoat that keeps them warm, like a, like a, a wool coat. And then they have um, the outer layer of fur that's practically waterproof water beads and rolls right off of them. So it allows them to stay warm in the water. It's like they're wearing a wetsuit or dry suit, I guess, is really what they're wearing. Um, and so it, uh, that's a really effective way of keeping them warm and dry. So there you go. I love it. They're warm, they're dry, they're furry little creatures. Mm -hmm. <sighs> very similar probably to the beaver pelt. Actually. Yes, very similar to beaver yeah. pelt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're a USDA inspector, you uh, that's that's a good test. Can you tell otter from beaver? <laughs> Probably something that's important for them to know. Cappy is just purring at me. Hi, kitty. No, you want it's playtime, isn't it? Okay, so why is my computer Discord? Send me an email. Come on. Doesn't want to. Well, when Discord can send me an email, I will go into the Discord. Uh, I have it on my phone. Don't ask me to join it on my computer. <laughs> but uh, it does sound like Twitch is a good... Yeah, so, so for, I mean... I like having a central place, yes, where it's not just during the show where we can all chat about the if people have things they want to talk about or whatever. So we do have the Discord, um, and uh, Hot Rod has put it into our free node IRC chat. It's in there. Um, and that is the link, the invitation link to get in. Um, the uh oh the discord not the twitch not yeah that's the discord not the twitch but twitch is another great platform um if people have if they if they want to get on the twitch the twitch is good it's nice to have a chat different places different places but you know during the show we're here so if you're on youtube or on facebook or twitch you're good i think i'm just kind of the free node has been kind of a place where if you wanted to IRC at any point, you could. But since people are concerned about all this um, free node stuff, I don't want that to be an issue. So join the Discord. Yay, Kevin Unique, you got in. I will get in eventually <laughs> to, to my Discord. <laughs> I'll get in someday. Someday. Maybe. Maybe I went to the trap. I don't know where anything is, but um, I just want a place where everyone can be together and be able to chat. So uh, Twitch chat is usually kind of there and good anyway. I think that's kind of how the Twitch chat works. Gord, if you could continue to corral people. Um, Fada. And Thunder Beaver, if you want to keep uh, keep tabs on the and moderate the uh, like, what was it? The lie. I see. I don't even know the new IRC. This is bad. If I don't know where it is, I won't be able to get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other IRC. Uh, you want if you want to hang on to that. Um, if people want to go to the other IRC, then that is great. Also, and Thunder Beaver has posted a Libera chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Flying Out. Thank you, Thunder Beaver. Hello, Gerard. Yes. How is Ireland right now? Probably early in the morning. Um, 
GitHub. Okay, I will uh, I'll click on that link and then I'll investigate that later. Wow. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Somebody would have to do it for me. I think. The mm. GitHub to link things together. I'm to figure out on it. Hmm. Fada, um, if you're going to go, thank you very much. We'll talk later. And uh, I think so far we're pulling it all together. Um, if we want to have, if people want to, I mean, this free node hashtag will be here if you forget. Um, I'll probably forget and come to free node um, before I remember Libera. But uh, there will also be the Discord if you want to be there. It seems to be the places that pe most people are going. Um, but keep me informed on how you're feeling about the chats and whether you're feeling connected. I want people to feel connected. That's what I want. If we can make it happen. Uh, the link that, uh, Kevin U Unique, the link that Hot Rod had shared earlier to Discord was the Twist invite link. And let me see if I can copy that and paste that down there. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so hopefully you'll be able to get into that Discord link if that works. Are you in, Blair? I'm in. I'm not. On my phone only. <laughs> I have no idea what my login is, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to join Discord on here. Hmm. You will. It will happen. I'm going to go back to my inbox. Maybe Discord will email me. Oh, I just got like not the email I wanted. <laughs> Why? Discord doesn't want to let me in. Okay, this is thrilling video, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Eric Knapp's story was I watched a sea otter in a small boat at the harbor swimming. Oh, scan this with your Discord mobile to log in. What? I don't know anything about that. Anyway, Scan QR code, please. Oh, great. Hello, technology. <laughs> <gasps> I'm in. <laughs> oh, Discord. There you are. Ooh, here I am. Yay. Let me all get in this time. Let me in, Discord. Here I am. Whole new chat room. Let me in, Discord. No. Oh, Thunder Beaver, you think I use a password manager? How quaint. <laughs> Uh, God darn it. <laughs> schmazzin, schmeezel, schmoozin, schmizzin, schmazzel, smeeshin. Copy. I have a password manager. I, I should get one. I have a notebook. <laughs> okay. Discord, you're fired. Why? <laughs> It's telling me that I have to enter an email address to verify my email address. And so I did. And now it's telling me that my email is already registered. Oh, good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Beep, boop, boop. Oh, it's okay. HNEK, we're here. It was a good show. You can watch it later. We had a good interview today. Yeah. It was fun. Twitch and YouTube, working okay. And Jerry, Gerard, you're using the emotes. We do like the emotes. We need. I need to figure out how to get uh, get 
twist emotes for our twist Twitch channel. I need to figure out how to do that. Twitch channel. Another invite to the Discord. Woohoo! The Twitch channel, eh? <laughs> I'm checking my email. It's not coming. I think I have email problems. I didn't think I do, but now I think I do. I'm just going to sit here. Oh, uh, Baba Brinkman is doing a Kickstarter right now. If you remember, uh, Baba, mm -hmm. the hip hop, the science hip hop artist who came to the show and did a wrap up at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. He's doing a Kickstarter to create a um, what he's calling uh, event rap, where he's got a group of different rappers that you can hire to do raps to rap for your event and to make raps for you. Which is kind of a cool idea, like bringing together the, the hip hop, hip hop writers. Gorge, you can help me on the emotes. That would be awesome. Yes, I don't know. I will try to get into Discord over the next few days. That's probably how long it will take me. I am apparently becoming one of those older people who no longer knows how to use technology. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I need to achieve and register for affiliate to get emotes on Twitch. I think I am an affiliate on Twitch. I We leveled up. We're no longer just basics. <laughs> just, just there. We got whatever the level one is. We're in. <laughs> it's all because of you, everybody. Over on Twitch. Woohoo. You know, in all the places... I find Discord overwhelming as well. I know, Identity 4. What is this newfangled nonsense? It's for shangled schmangles. Nonsense. Cappy, are you just clawing at the walls? Yes, you are. Wow. I swear my cat's going to climb up the wall. <laughs> Noodles, you feel Discord is good for your gray hairs? Yes. <laughs> I'll figure out how to get into Discord. Why? I never got a verification email from Twitch, so it's got to be an email that I can an old Discord email that I can use to get in, right? Oh, man. How long will it take for me to get a Twitch email? <laughs> I gave up. I'm now. I'm now. Wait, did I get it? No. Now I'm hoping for a text message from Discord. I did. I got a text mm. message from Discord. That's fun. That's exciting. Phones. They sometimes. Why aren't I getting it? This is frustrating. How about resend code? Resend? Yes. Yes, Discord. It's great. You're fighting with Discord and I'm fighting with Twitch. <laughs> Let's fight the technology. Fight the power. Fight the power. Fight the power that be. Uh, fight the power. Fight the technology. Uh. Come on, dude. And now... Nope, no luck. No luck. Discord, you're discombobulating me. I guess I will pick a different email address. Oh, maybe it'll work this time. Yeah. I, it doesn't want to help me. I'll do it. 
Too many accounts, too many things, all y'all. Did I use a different email? I might have, but I don't think so because I was looking in my password manager and my password manager is telling me this particular email. Oh my. So that's annoying. Yeah. Why would that be wrong? Hmm. So now hmm? I'm going to have to search. Hmm. I have to search all my emails and see if I can find something else. Yeah. Oh, I must have changed my password. That's the problem. Oops. That's what's wrong. <laughs> I'm a mess. Hot Rod. Darn it. That's right. My password. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Thank you. That's right. Registration issues. Well, I can go back to my, if we, let's have, let me move away, move away. I got distracted by, uh, yes, I am invited to be a Twitch affiliate. I leveled yeah. up, it says, the Twitch affiliate program. And yeah, I think this is for the Twiss account. Uh, yeah. Get started. I'll click that button. Get started. Log into Twitch. Okay, log in. Uh, Now I need a token. So many tokens, so little time. This is technology. There we go. La la la. Nope. I hit a button. This is good television, huh? I know. Great television, everybody. Did you get into, did everyone get into Discord? I haven't. <laughs> I'm on Twitch, so. But I'm on Twitch. Woohoo! I can be an affiliate. Affiliate onboarding. That's Ta-da. Great. Ta-da. So we have full coverage because I'm in Discord and you're in Twitch. So <laughs> we're, you know. we're totally covered. It's great. This is perfect. Oh, now I'm confused. Oh, there we go. Where's my email? <laughs> <laughs> I've given up. I've given up. I probably have a different... Um, I probably have a different password in there somewhere. Yeah, random emotes. Oh, look, our chat room is becoming more Twitchified. There are many more Twitch Ooh. comments coming in right now. Is our are our, our, our YouTubers still there? If I could have anyone on the show that we haven't already, who would it be? Hmm, John Hogan, that's a great question. I have I have all sorts of people I would like to interview. Ooh, make sure I get my numbers right. Woo, I can be an affiliate now. That's awesome. Okay, I'm in there. I'm just going to leave that. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, what? Yes. Uh, until I finish affiliate onboarding, we cannot make any money through Twitch. Uh, mm. But once I do the affiliate onboarding, then then uh, we can get people can give us tips and they can do all sorts of great things. We, we can have Twitch money. Yes. So this is great. It's a good step. It's nice. Thank you, Twitch. Mike Shoemaker, still on all the places. 
Oh, I'm verified. Thank goodness. You're verified. <laughs> I'm not. I am not verified. I am unverifiable. Okay. Channel. Okay, I don't want to do my financial stuff while I'm sitting here. I don't have a channel. How do I find Twist and Twitch? Twist Science. T-W-I-S. Science. I don't even know. I don't know how to use this. <laughs> <laughs> you can do oh. it, Blair. I have faith in you. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I'll, fit, I'll send you all my favorite DJ channels on Twitch. Okay. <laughs> how do I? <sighs> okay. You can do it. You can get there. <laughs> I don't know Kevin how Unique is like is talking this smack about Discord right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, that's great. Okay, Kevin Unique. Go to bed. We've had our our kind of chat room IRC conversation. Um, we have the things that are going. Thank you for those of you who are diving oh, yeah. over to Discord, those of you that are diving over to Twitch, if that's where you want to want to go. Thanks for trying new things out. It's always good to try out new things, even as a grown-up, um, because it helps with the maintenance of your brain cells in your brain. Mm -hmm. It's going to keep you younger longer as you're older. Uh, yes, chat room roulette. Oh, Blair made it over. I see people have found the Blairs. Did you make it? I made it. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> Melisande is in there. Yes. Melisande, you have too many windows open. That happens all the time. Who who should we interview big names in the future? Jane Goodall? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Lowell. That's a San Francisco sure high school, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, oh, yeah, what? Discord who is are popping. you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Everyone's like, Blair's in the chat. Woohoo. <laughs> How's that wall? How's that wall? <laughs> who are these people in the chat? Oh, it's Danilo. Hey. <laughs> no way that's awesome that's awesome i don't know who danilo is but that's i that do know cool. <laughs> i know you do that's why i was saying that's awesome it's good that's very cool i don't want that i want um let's see so next week we have an interview Justin will probably be back. I mean, unless his flight takes a week. I know. Here's Sadie. He'll be um, yep. wonderfully. There you go. Um, he'll be wonderfully jet lagged by next <laughs> Wednesday. I'm sure. I'm sure. Which will always make for a fun show. But yeah, we should have we should have a team meeting we should mm -hmm. schedule video watchings and all the funs yes we should oh there's the sadie yeah we should watch movies together so this evening um the the movie of choice in this household was uh Destroy all the monsters. Oh yeah, the the original one. Mm -hmm. The yeah. nineteen sixty eight Japanese 
All the Monsters movie. And I want to tell you all what a terrible movie it is. Pretty boring, I spent, huh? ha- I spent half the movie going, what is going on? What is going on? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> What's happening? They were Night destroying noodles. all the monsters. <laughs> they were, but it took them until the end of the movie to kill all the monsters. And then there were these aliens who were controlling everybody with like little BBs in the back of your heads and or your earrings, maybe even for your mind. Key spoilers. Yeah, aliens. That I know didn't the look like aliens. Fifty years old, but spoilers. <sighs> Come on. I don't know. Go see it. You should see Destroy All Monsters. And I want a book report next week. <laughs> My friends uh, just saw that at the Kabuki Theater in San Francisco. They did a whole Godzilla weekend. Oh, it's fun. Kai would have loved that. Kai is a huge Godzilla fan. Loves Godzilla movies. My very first uh, movie back in theaters... Um, since the pandemic was uh, Godzilla versus Kong, <laughs> a friend of mine it rented a... out a theater. So, oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, that's so it was everyone right. we knew. Everybody was vaccinated. <laughs> so, and we had there were like ten of us in the whole theater. So, it's very cool. That would be a lot of fun. I think I would enjoy a movie in that situation at a movie theater. But otherwise, I still don't think I'd want to go to a movie theater. But the other aspect of that is Godzilla versus Kong. That was also a very bad movie. (laughs) (laughs) It was fun to watch in theaters. But yes, it was very, very, very bad. The plot made no sense. Made no sense. Uh, Wiz Mike, our free node IRC has been with Twist for a very long time. Um, since about the time that we started doing online broadcasts. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I want to say it was probably after it was, uh, what, 2000... 11-ish because the IRC uh, got started after Twit, right? Was it was the IRC Oh, that's a good question. Because we had the Twit IRC and then we moved and started doing Google Plus uh, the Hangouts for the broadcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually I think that that would have been 2013? 2013. So I started in January of 2012. Did we have the chat then? Well, we were on Twitch when I started. Right. Yeah. And so there was the. And I was on Twitch for, I think, at least a year. Yeah. Before we moved. Yeah. I want to say that. Right. I think so, Gord. Yeah. I think it was right around then because that was when we were leaving. We were like, oh, but we don't want to lose the chat because there wasn't the possibility of having a chat. And then um, and then the room was started. And it's been there. And you have taken care of it. <laughs> and it's been a home for our chatting. It's so weird, you know, you put yourself on these different platforms and we're still putting ourselves on these different platforms and Mm -hmm. we're just kind of at the whim of the platform. And if the platform does something bad or Hmm. there's an impropriety or if, you know, the platform just decides to shut down, like all of a sudden it's like, and that's it. You know, you're that's that's it. So I understand the drive by many people to kind of create their own ecosystems, their own places to put things. But yeah, but we keep jumping. Yeah. Oh, well, Mike, you found us with Google Plus. Awesome. 
It's I definitely I at first I thought new tech. Um, new tech. New tech. When when new Twit tech. was no longer an option, I didn't know how uh how resilient the show was yet. Because I was still pretty new and I was like, Oh that sucks, it's over. <laughs> It's going to be gone forever. And uh, no, nope. that was a fun year, I guess. <laughs> but January, I will have been on this show for a decade. Wow. Yep. That's right. Yeah, because you came in the year after Kai was born. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diversification, stream Nilo diversification or denilo yes diversification is uh is good get your, get ourselves out to many places which is why i like Streamyard, and it's great uh i hope they continue for a very long time and are very a good platform but i've always got uh, vmix or obs in my back pocket in case uh we have to uh, manage everything on our own in case the mm -hmm. platform that we're using for broadcasting, you know, decides to drop. So, you know, there are other there are other ways, to, <laughs> other ways to fix things, and, and so there's always the plan B in the back of the mind. Yeah, but definitely building broad reach. And I think Gord was saying that before. Get on the different platforms twitch and youtube and facebook and then there's more of an opportunity for people to find us as well which is good uh, and thunder beaver is saying if with irc twist could technically run its own server and federate with other servers yeah that's that's true i have talked for years about having my own server and then i'm like i don't want to deal with my own server <laughs> <laughs> you I have get to have wait enough at my computers that. that I use. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to deal with my server. I don't want to yeah. do that. Yeah. You have to have a staff for that. Yes. <laughs> Identity four. If I ever manage to get back into Discord, which <laughs> I'm wondering how I'm gonna do it at this point. We'll see. But yeah, we should I will add a channel for story suggestions. You can probably I think do that now. Great. Let me see. Can you do it? Let me see. <laughs> I don't know if I believe you about your article spam identity for. Yeah, I Gord, well, I don't know if I do miss Google Plus. Uh I used it a bit for a while and then I didn't very much and I got a lot of spam because of the way Google put their algorithm together. Yes, on Discord I can assign Yes, I can do that, Hot Rod. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't have yeah. permission to do that, it looks like. Oh, well. Elam Orchard, yes. It is hard to do all of the things. <laughs> I'm going to do the communication and creation, and I'm going to do the IT working, all the things. It's just that time of night where I'm just going to... Sing random show tunes. No, they're not show tunes. They are if you want them to be. Yeah. Uh, channel twist. What is that? Did I click? Oh, am I going to go someplace else? Stride. Oh, there you go. Channel twist created Friday, June 29th, 610, 59 seconds. 2012. Oh. Thank you, Stride. Awesome. That was way sooner than I thought. That was about when I thought. Yeah. Wow. I was only on Twitch for six months. Yipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that long. Or not Twitch. Twit. Twit. I'm about yeah. Twit. Too many twizzes. Oh, we need to start our own thing. Hmm. Or it's... Yeah, we're... Yeah, maybe you were on it for only... A little bit? I don't know. It's so crazy how only the gist is left at the end. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. Uh... 
I remember yeah, that was... in the end, nobody knows why, but we weren't on Twitter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. It's the it end. Just one day, we weren't. Nope. Sadie's licking my feet right now. <laughs> <laughs> she's like boofing wasn't working jumping on you wasn't working so what I'm gonna lick, lick your, your feet? feet very good oh maybe it's that password I'm still I'm gonna oh, it's the same password I should be able to get into discord I don't know why it doesn't like me and why it's not sending me any oh Blah, Hi, Ed. It doesn't in like YouTube. copy and paste. <sighs> Hi, Ed, who sent test. Test. Hello, Are you test real Ed. or a robot? <laughs> it's a test, Ed. Test, Ed. What are you doing? You're a silly puppo. Okay, fine, I won't pet you. <laughs> she's such a cat. I oh. just tend to touch her and she's like, no. I finally I finally uh tried to get in I hit my password to get in and now it says that Discord has crashed unexpectedly. Oh. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Oh we really don't want you in there. I don't know what's going on. Oh, and now I'm now I'm in. Nope. Wait, am I? Can I log in? No. Oh my gosh. It doesn't think I'm human. said welcome back we're so excited to see you again and i said yes thank you very much i am human and i said nope no no maybe i'll just tell them that i forgot my password Ta -da. now more hoops jumped through we're making it going to bed john hogan i'm gonna think about the answer to that question because there are many people out there I would like to speak with I just have I have never been excuse me I've started to get the yawns I've never been great at remembering names mm -hmm. which isn't the best I do try I do try I don't if know, should Beekman we... was a real person, I would want him on the show. Who? Beekman. Beekman. <laughs> oh, well, we still need to try and get um, Bill Nye, the science guy, on the show. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. That would that would be that would be pretty great. <laughs> it would be fun. It would be. Oh my god! I will get into discord next year maybe huh. possibly i don't know i'm gonna huh. try everyone i know hot rod it's not that <laughs> and if i get into discord then i will make people mods and i will give people manager managerial access mm -hmm. and then i yes and we will have more categories of channels to post in so many things yeah did we oh you talked to the stream yard folks they are very nice i like them they seem very nice I'm yeah. logging into Zazzle to see if anyone bought anything I made last week. Did anybody buy anything? No. Oh, maybe that's what it is. It is I have an older Mac. Uh, maybe that has something to do with it. Because it really doesn't like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, sure. 
her, I'll send you an email. <laughs> uh, just tell her we sent the email. Nobody Bye. bought the leggings. <laughs> I haven't bought them yet. Yeah, what gives? I'm going to, though. I mean, orange twist leggings? Come on. They're great. Pretty great. It's pretty great. No, you can't lock me out, shoe brew. Ha 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 ha. Thunder Beaver, I should probably actually try contacting them. Um, yeah, that would be, that would be good. It would be epic. Be like, so, we all have friends in common. Would you like to join us on the show? <sighs> You're going to save locking me out for April 1st? Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's another thing we could do? It, yeah. Well, I know Carrie Byron and an, a science video maker have a Kickstarter that they're doing, and they're going to be doing some amazing um, science communication for, I think, uh, like, not kids, but like the mid-age and teens. So not quite teens and teenagers. Um which sounds very exciting. So maybe they would want to come on the show and talk about their video project, which would be, that would be cool. That's very cool. Could be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We should try and get more, more science, science uh, creators on the show. People who do cool things. Yeah. That would be yeah. very neat. I, um, I love following Svaha on uh, Facebook all of their uh, clothes. They're like science-based women's clothes. Very yes. cool. Um, yeah, I like to see all their newest stuff. It's really nice. Just Staha. stuff like that. Like somebody using fractals to make art. I would love to interview them. <laughs> fractals for art? What was yeah. there? Somebody who told us about somebody down in uh, Eugene. Who does fractal? Who who studies fractals? I don't remember who that was though. But there's supposed to be somebody fractally here in Oregon yeah. that we should get in touch with for fractals. Somebody's fractal for fractals. Yes, for fractal sake. <laughs> Wow. I, I'm looking in our Zazzle store and I'm looking at our most popular items. It's very interesting. Yeah? Yeah. Um, there are four face masks in the top ten. <laughs> that is telling for the yeah. last... Lots of people bought our face masks, which period is Period cool. of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. 19 people bought the mammoth face mask. I like the mammoth face mask. Yeah. I like that but one. yeah, in the top... Well, in the top six, there are four masks <laughs> we have the twist logo t-shirt the twist logo mug then the mammoth mask the red panda mask the twist and then two different twist logo masks <laughs> that's the top six you know i look forward to the day that masks are not the top sellers yeah yeah some people are buying our twist uh polo shirts that's cool Oh, cool. Are those back in stock? I thought they were out of stock. I mean, they while. appear to be back in stock. Hope they're back. They might not be. Um... Yeah, I think what happened was they stopped doing embroidery. So I redesigned it with a screen oh, print. Got it. And now they can sell them again. <laughs> yep. That makes sense. So gotta do what they can do and four people have bought my um uh my tote to carry all of your um stuff <laughs> that has the dung beetle on it <laughs> so that's fun to carry your dung beetle stuff 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 yes, yes. that's fun that's very fun the pillows seem popular too, although nobody's bought my new pillows. 
Andy for fractals in art. Hmm. Ooh, two people have bought the banana slug pillow. That's very fun. Yes. Sluggy pillows. Sluggy pillows. Oh, now the leggings are good. Ooh, four people bought the mammoth pillow. How fun. Anyway, <laughs> twist leggings. Everybody buy your twist leggings. <laughs> Woohoo! For you or one that you love. Do we have... Let's see. It's June already. This, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully mm -hmm. it is a nice holiday weekend for a lot of people who are watching right now. Hopefully a bunch of you get the day off or days off mm -hmm. hopefully you will be safely enjoying a nice warm weekend wherever you are hopefully it'll be lovely weather for you to enjoy don't get sunburned mm -hmm. <laughs> but i think i am I'm, i need to go i need to go to bed mm -hmm. i'm starting to yawn and I'm tired of Discord, so <laughs> <laughs> I need to go away from the Discord not emailing me for a while. Yeah. You're going to continue on. Good job, Thunder Beaver. Identity 4, yes, go to the beach. That sounds awesome. I like beaches. If the weather is nice, maybe I'll find a nice Portland beach. <laughs> there are beaches by the rivers. I could find something like that. Yes. Oh, Shoe Brew, I'm sorry. Your car is in the shop. Yes, and it's time for Susie and the Banshees. Maybe I can, like, put my headphones in and be like, I'm happy here in the happy house. Happy things. Yes. Say goodnight, Kiki. <laughs> yeah, good night, Kiki. Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good night. Good night, everyone. Minions. Yeah. yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again and for talking through the IRC with us. Um, things will work their way through. We will see you on Twitch. We will see you on Discord. We will see you on YouTube. We will see you on Facebook. Um, and maybe we will see you in Libera chat. Or, uh, But I think this chat will probably fade away, this free node chat that we've had since... 2012 it's had a nice run it's pretty good but we're all still sciencing on together and we'll be back here again next week this show is not going anywhere so i hope that we see you i'm going to look for your names i'm going to look for all of your names i'm going to take names next week okay <laughs> present. To... that's right everybody say present i'm here yes here okay have a wonderful weekend and We'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. Good night.